well, like I said in the announcements, attendance will be done like it usually is for live streaming. I'm going to give you some keywords. Um, and at the end of the lecture, send me an email. But make sure you send it right away. Um, but before that, I'm actually going to take attendance, you know, to see who's physically or who's online right now. Just because I don't want somebody who's not online to send me an email and say, hey, these were the keywords. Then I'll know, obviously, someone just gave them the keywords. So that's the reason we're doing this. Um, I'm going to call out names, but you'll still need to send me the email. So here we go. Um, if you hear your name, please let me know. I remember seeing Boyd's name, so skip that. Um, Reed. All right. And then McDay is here. Reedy. Oh, sorry. Who was that? Oh, I was about to say here. but Okay. You're, you're good. Okay. Um, is Reedy here? Chloe. All right. Bunch. Okay. I know Davis is here. Uh, Cordon. Valencia, Simpson, Robinson, Vance, I know White is here, Breeden, I know Schmidt is here, so is Paige Ramsey, and Wall, uh, Flores, okay, Thompson, oh, Hemrick is here, Harvey, Ramsey, excuse me, yeah. Marissa, okay, gotcha. Um, Buckley, Knox, saw Kenny come in, um, and Smalls. Anybody I didn't call? All right, a little heads up too before we get started. Make sure that you're signed into your WVSU email account before you, um, oh, hey Valencia, let me get you down here. It is still eight after all. All right, Valencia, I see that you're here. Anyway, in the future, if you can, make sure you're logged into your WVSU email account because if you try to come in with um, a different account, it'll ask for my permission. And in a situation like this, I can do it and I can click and let you in. But if we're like, if I'm in Hamlin Hall and it's 8.02 and I'm actually lecturing, I might not even hear the chime that says you're trying to come in. So if you can, make sure you're logged into your WVSU WV, WVSU email account. Uh, Bunch, I saw that you're here. Good morning. Uh, where are we at here? All right. So that, should be, that should be everybody. Um, should be accounted for, I think. So let's get started then. Um, Cordon, I see you're here, but you'll just send me, you know, everybody, you'll be sending me an email at the end of the lecture with the, with the um, attendance keywords. So We'll take care of that, you know, after lecture. So anyway, speaking of which, the first keyword for attendance today is psychology, like the class you might take, you know, the science dealing with the brain. Psychology is the first keyword. Um, all right, let's get started. First of all, let me share my whole screen. And we'll pick up where we left off with chapter two. And if you remember, we just kind of did the introduction to chapter two, which is good. We didn't get into the any of the... Uh, the really good stuff, the really important stuff. But at least we got the fluffy stuff out of the way. So can someone please confirm? Ah, not that one. Oh, well. Can someone please confirm that they can see um, my PowerPoint slide like it, it would normally look? We could see it. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So here we go. Let's get into it. This one's, again, I said this at the end of the last lecture, but this chapter is broken down into two main points. We're going to talk about some basic chemistry. And then we're going to talk about basically how water is involved with chemistry and how basically we couldn't have life without it. So here we go. Um, I think I mentioned this just uh, Monday as well. This is nothing that's going to be on the exam, but hope, you know, if you're asking yourself, well, I took biology, why are we learning chemistry? And the answer is this slide right here, basically, because to truly understand anything about biology, you really need to understand the chemistry of it. Um, and if we also remember the end of chapter one, when we talked about all those different levels you know, where we talk, you know, we look at things at the molecular level, then we look at things at the cellular level, and then we look at things at maybe the tissue level, right? All those things are interconnected. And to understand those higher levels, you've got to understand the lower levels, which is why we're starting at chemistry right now. Then we'll start looking at large molecules, then we'll start looking, at, we'll spend a lot of time looking at how cells work, excuse me, and then later on we'll look at um, 
larger things like how different organisms interact with each other. But yeah, so that's why you need to know chemistry. Again, not going to be on the exam, but I just want you to know why I'm, I'm forcing you to sit through this lecture and listen to uh, me talk about chemistry. So any questions so far? All right, here we go. This first portion is going to be filled with a lot of words that you need to know. Not necessarily, I mean, I might ask you the words on the exam. I don't know. But more importantly, you need to know these words that I'm about to give you because I'm going to be using them a lot, um, especially through, I'd say, the first half of the semester. So here we go. Um, if you see, I don't make these memes. I just find them. So does anybody know what matter is in this context? What is matter? Or what do you think it is? I love wrong answers to me are better than right answers. If you get it right, then I just like say, space. Yeah. What is it? Space. Being I taken. like that because space is involved in the word space is used in most of the definitions I've seen for matter. So good. We're on the right track. What about space? Because technically, actually, if it's just space, that's actually the wrong answer. And you'll see why here in a second. Something that takes up space. There you go. Something that takes up space. Anything that occupies space and has mass. So then hopefully your question then is, okay, well, then what is mass? And we'll talk about that here in a second. But first, here's the easy part that I think you probably all know. Does anybody know the three states of matter? The three. Gas, solid, and liquid. Good. Gas, solid, liquid. Perfect. Um, I probably won't ask you that just because it's too easy, but we'll see. So yeah, that's matter. Matter matter. in the uh, colloquial terms, you could just say is stuff. What is matter? Matter is stuff, right? Um, and that's why I was glad you said space because, again, first of all, that's in the definition. But also, it is worth pointing out that space, in a sense, is almost like the opposite of matter, right? Because space is a vacuum. It's nothingness. And matter is something. Um, any questions so far about what matter is? All right. So then let's keep moving forward. Like we said, matter has mass. So what is mass? It's the measure of the amount of material in an object. So again, um, colloquially speaking, matter is stuff. And mass is how much stuff is in it, right? It's just a measure of the amount. Um, so you might say you're you know, so many pounds or so many kilograms, right? That's how much stuff is in you. Um, does anybody have any questions about what mass is? All right, here's a little bit more of a trickier concept. It's not that tricky, but in my opinion, it's a little bit trickier than the words matter and mass. And a little bit more important as far as the exam is concerned, because you need to know what an element is for the exam. So let's talk about it. Does anybody have any guesses? I mean, we all know what an element is. And, you know, if I were to ask you to give an example, I'm sure people could come up with a lot of it, examples. But now that we're sitting here um, having a biology lecture, can anyone explain to me what an element is? And that's okay if you can't. Again, there's going to be a lot of words like this, where words where you know you know what it is, but when someone asks you to actually put it into words, it's a little bit tougher. So an element, first of all, it cannot be broken down into any other substances by chemical reactions. And you'll see why when we talk about what makes up an um, what makes up an element. But yeah, you can't break down an element anymore using chemical reactions. So, for example, an atom of, of oxygen, that's it. You can't like well, first of all, the oxygen you're breathing, that's a molecule. Those are two oxygens bonded together, and you can break that down. You can break down that molecule to where you have one oxygen atom and another oxygen atom separately, right? But that one oxygen atom, that element, you can't break down break that down anymore chemically. Now you could, you know, take off some electrons and we'll talk about what you name that, but that's not necessarily, I, I won't get into that yet. You can't break it down anymore, right? That is what it is. Now you could break down the nucleus and we'll talk about that and get rid of some protons, um, but that would be a completely different story and that wouldn't be a chemical reaction. If you get rid of protons, it's basically um, a nuclear reaction. That's where you have things like um, radioactivity, but we don't get into that in this class. So as far as you're concerned, in this course, an element just cannot be broken down anymore. And again, technically, what I mean by that is the chemical reactions. But as far as we're concerned, they just can't be broken down anymore. And that brings us to this next point. Since we've talked about matter, let's bring it all together. Um, an element, or excuse me, all matter is composed of elements. So everything you see, everything that occupies space and has mass, all the stuff, 
at all. Um, it's all one form. It's an element. It's one element or another. Or if they've come together, multiple elements. Any questions about this slide? All right. Here we go. Your book gives some examples. You do not need to know any examples. There's four... There's four elements you need to know, and I'll let you know when we get there. But for now, we're just talking. I'm giving you some examples. Hopefully, you're familiar with them. Again, these came from your book, and I teach out of your book, so here they are. And your book also points out that there are 92 naturally occurring elements. You do not need to know that number either. This is for your own knowledge, right? We're just talking about what we know about elements. 92 naturally occurring ones. Um, some ones you might be familiar with, carbon. Or carbon's a big one when you talk about um, environmental science. We'll talk about that later. Oxygen, Oxy obviously that's a big one. We need that to live. I mean, technically, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Potassium, that's another one you're probably familiar with. You know, when people say, oh, it's, oh your, your muscles are sore, eat some bananas, get some potassium. Gold, right? Uh, a lot of people like gold for wearing or for their electronics, whatever the case may be. Uh, your book also points out that each element has a symbol that's derived from the English, Latin, or German name. Again, nothing you need to know there. So essentially... As far as the exam is concerned and as far as understanding material that comes later, nothing on this slide is important. But again, I teach out of the book, so I like to go along with the way your book does it. So if you're following along in your book, you kind of know where we are. So any questions about this slide? All right. The next word, keyword for attendance, this is going to be different. It's going to be your last name. So this word, obviously, will be different for every person. Well, two of you have the same last name, but other than that, everybody's going to have a different word. So this, again, the second word for attendance is going to be your last name. Any questions about that? All right. So, again, 92 naturally occurring elements. That's, you know, this chunk right here. Those are the naturally occurring ones. Um, these down here are the not-so-naturally occurring ones. Um, this thing here that we're looking at is a periodic table of elements. You're going to use some in lab, but generally speaking, that's it. You're not really going to need, as far off the top of my head, you're really not going to need this for this semester. Um, moving forward, I am going to talk a little bit more about this, but your book is zooming in here to the carbon. Um, its atomic symbol is C. Nothing you need to memorize. It's just an example. Its atomic number is 6, and that's the number of protons, but we're about to talk about that here in a second. So for now, I'll just leave it at that. And the atomic mass, which is the mass of uh, the uh, mass of the average element um, excuse me mass of the average atom of that element and uh, carbons happens to be 12.01 so moving forward we're going to go a little bit deeper and talk about these numbers but for now that's just an introduction and as a matter of fact sometimes when you look at a periodic table you'll get slightly different information um, or maybe slightly more information but anyway any questions about that Again, carbon's just an example. So if you're make if you're studying for the exam and making flashcards, don't feel like you need to memorize <clears throat> the atomic number and the atomic mass and the element symbol of carbon. All right, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm not going to do this. But basically, just to break things up because people find chemistry very boring. Um, basically, I have like a little guessing game where I show you the element and give you a hint of what it is. Um, this is mercury. That up there is mercury. That's supposed to look like Freddie Mercury. Uh, that's copper. That's a guy named David Copperfield. That's lead. <clears throat> um, those are the symbols for a band called Led Zeppelin. Uh, there's some iron up top. And uh, that is periodic symbol supposed to look like, you know, Iron Man. Anyway, here we go. If you're taking notes, either write down that this slide is important or write down what the slide says. Either way, um, this is information you need to know. So again, there's 92 naturally occurring elements. That number is not too important. What you should know is that there are 25 elements that are essential to people. So of those 92, 25 of them, we have to have them. So make sure you know that number. More importantly than that number, because I might or might not ask you how many there are, what you do need to know is what I call the big four. Because the four that I'm about to tell you make up 96% of your body weight. And I think you probably can guess three of the, at least guess three of the four. So, for example, thinking about what you breathe in and what you breathe out, or 
more specific, if you're going to be more accurate, um, why you breathe in, like what are you trying to get when you breathe in, and what are you getting, trying to get rid of when you breathe out? Can someone guess two of the four elements based off that hint I just gave you? Oxygen. Oxygen. Yep, oxygen was the other one. Carbon dioxide. Good. good. All right. Now then, what's one? Uh, that's good. So we have two. Now let me give you another hint. What's one thing that we all need to live? Every living thing needs to live. Water. Water. And what's water made up of? H. Yep. Hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah, good. And we already said hydrogen, right? So there we go. We've very easy to remember the three of the big four oxygen and carbon because we're breathing them, uh, oxygen and hydrogen because they make up water. <clears throat> the other one that might be hard for you maybe is nitrogen. But yeah, so those are the big four. No, the big four. And by the time we're done with these next two chapters and by the time you're done with lab, Hopefully that's something you won't even need to study. You'll just be so used to seeing oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. But yeah, 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 got it. Because everything, it's just so much of the stuff we talk about involves those. <clears throat> so again, know the big four. <clears throat> Excuse me. You do not need to know that the big four make up about 96% of the body weight. Not for the exam. You don't need to know that. Just so you know, that's why we call it the big four or why I call it the big four. Because it's not just a majority of your body weight, but a large majority, right? Only, only about 4% makes up the other um, 21 elements, right? So obviously, most of you, is a large majority of you is made up with oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. So any questions about that? All right. Here we go. Again, let's talk about the other 4%. And again, you don't need to memorize the fact that it's 4%. Just know that the big four, huge majority, and then everything else, smaller majority. Um, so this will make more sense when I show you a, um, a picture at the end, but we're going to press forward for now. So much of the other 4% um, includes seven elements. Now remember four and seven, that doesn't make up 25, but we'll talk about that later. So again, we have the big four and then what we have is what I call the, the smaller seven, not the smallest, but the smaller, um, definitely not as big as the big four, but not as small as the other stuff we're telling you. Your book doesn't even give all the examples. So I'm only going to give you the examples that the book gives you. Calcium is one of them. I'm sure you heard of it. Um, you don't need to know this for the exam. And I'm sure you know a lot of this anyway. But what is calcium good for? It's good for bones. It's good for teeth. Some other stuff that your book didn't even list. Where can you find it? You can find it dairy products, sardines, green, leafy vegetables. This is not a nutrition class. You do not need to know that. So right now, actually, let me put a big X through this just so you know. <laughs> Let's keep things easy. For the exam, I'm not going to ask you about these seven elements, much less why they're important or where you can find them. This is just for your own knowledge. Um, but this is also a good independent work topic. So I've listed some stuff that calcium is good for and some places you can find it. So you could also look in where el what else is it good for? Where else can I find it? Another thing you can ask yourself is how much calcium do we need? Another thing you can ask yourself is how much calcium is too much? What happens if you don't have enough calcium? What happens if you have too much calcium? Anyway, moving forward, the same questions could be asked about phosphorus, but here's the information that your book gives you about phosphorus. It's a component of DNA. We'll learn all about that later in the semester. You can find it in eggs. You can find it in beans. You can find it in nuts. Another thing that it's a component of, and I don't know why your book didn't mention this, but I'm going to go ahead and write it, even though I'm not going to test you on it yet, is a very important component of a little molecule called ATP which is one that's a very, very important molecule. The whole exam too was basically based on ATP and you'll see why when we get there. But for now, just throwing that out there. Anyway, again, calcium and phosphorus, just two examples, great independent work, independent work topics if you wanna look into it. How much is too much? How much is not enough? Blah, 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 blah. Let's talk about the other five, right? Cause we're talking about seven elements here. I've given you two. Oh. Excuse me, no, I'm not going to talk about the other five. Let me cross that out. I need to fix this. Don't see the upcoming slide for the other five. Just look into it if you want. I think your book does list the other five. I have a picture that shows the other five, but that's it for now. Any questions about these seven elements? The small seven, as I call them. All right, so now let's talk about the rest of them. There are something called trace elements, and I'm, you know, the big four, the small seven, those are my words. Trace elements, that's a real term. Trace elements. There's 14 of them. Um, you don't you don't need to know that number, but let's talk about why the trace or why they're called trace elements. 
because they make up less than 0.01% of your weight. So very, very, very small amount. You don't need to know that number. But we're just talking about these 14 elements and how small they are, how much of a minuscule amount you need. Um, but despite the fact that you need a very, very, very small amount of them, they are essential for life. And again, I would ask you the same questions that I asked you about the other seven as far as independent work is concerned if you want to look into it. As I'm telling you these things, you could ask yourself, what are they used for? Where can you get it? How much is too much? Um, and how much do you need? Then what happens if you don't have enough? What happens if you have too much? Your book gives you some of that. For example, iodine. Um, the deficiency of iodine causes goiter. That's this thing right here at the bottom right. You can see that thing on her, on her neck. Um, she's not a hamster, you know, holding <laughs> nuts or seeds. That's an actual growth um, of the thyroid. And you can find iodine in things like green vegetables, eggs, seafood, dairy products, and iodized salt. So if you ever wondered what they mean by iodized salt, that's what they mean. Somebody has put, or they have put iodine in your salt because you need it. But again, this, I'm putting it next to it because it's just an example. I'm not going to ask you any questions about iodine on the exam. If I remember correctly, there are some questions on the study guide, but not on the exam. And again, you can look into it if you want to um, for independent work. Um, fluorine is another example. Fluorine is added to dental products and drinking water because we need it to maintain healthy bones and teeth. And fluorine is one of my favorite because there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there who talk about how dangerous it is. And, you know, you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't drink city water because fluorine is killing you. And this goes back to some of the questions I've already been asking you for independent work. How much do you need? And then how much is too much? And this brings me to, I think this is the first time I've said this this semester, but it's a very important concept. The dose makes the poison. So there's all kinds of things that you need. Like, again, you need fluorine, but if you have too much, it is poisonous. And there's a lot of things like that. I mean, technically, I think technically anything is poisonous if you have enough of it. Like water can kill you if you have enough but or too much, but it's hard to get that much. Anyway, that's just something to keep in mind. Everything is a poison um, depending on the... The dosage. So when you eat an apple, for example, if I remember correctly, it's arsenic. You're getting some arsenic in apple. An apple and arsenic is generally considered a poison because it takes a very small amount for it to be a poison. But it's an even smaller amount in an apple. So anyway, that's just an example. You don't need to know anything about apples or arsenic for the exam. You don't need to know anything about fluorine. These are just examples of some trace elements. But are there any questions about fluorine? All right. Um, trace elements in food. This is good. You should, if you get a chance, if you download the PowerPoint and you click this right here, there's a video that talks about trace, um, yeah, trace elements that you can find in food. Here's a good one. Iron, right? The metal, right? So when you see, you know, a rusty metal somewhere, that's iron, right? Iron that's been rusted. Technically that's iron oxide, but that's iron. That's metal. And that is what is in your food because your body, you literally need iron, the metal, you need it. Um, a lot of times you get it from things like red, red meat, right? Um, but also, and you've probably seen this on cereal boxes, which is why I have a picture of it and I just circled it. People, excuse me, companies will put iron into the cereal. So it is called Fortis, fortified with iron, meaning when they made the cereal, it didn't naturally have iron in it. So they put it in there. Um, which brings me back to the video. If I remember correctly, ah, I wish I remembered which one it was. So there's two different videos that show the same thing, but it goes to show how people will try to scare you with misinformation or, excuse me, try to scare you even by giving you the real information. So anyway, there's two videos, both of which include somebody getting a box of cereal and putting some of it into a blender and putting some water in the blender and blending it up to where it's a big mush, right? <clears throat> and then on both videos, they put a magnet and they put it to the side of the blender and they let things settle down. And then eventually you can see that the metal, the iron in the cereal has um, attached itself to the magnet because it is iron, it is a metal. So, and here's the difference. And one of the videos people are saying, remember how I, and basically, People are saying, remember how I said iron is an essential element and it's fortified in your food? Well, this is proof that it's in your food, right? Showing you that, yes, it is in your food, like they claim. And then another one is like, look what they're putting in your food. There's literally iron, you know, there's literally metal shavings in your food. 
And yes, there is. So again, it's such a, you know, such a difference when people are presenting the same information. And in this case, neither one of them is lying. It's just the, the manner in which they're presenting it. One of them is trying to scare you by telling you something that people have done on purpose for good reasons. So again, as a college educated citizen, as a critical thinker, these are things you need to be aware of. So when someone tells you some information that seems really scary, just take a step back and think, well, okay, but that does sound scary, but is it scary? Or is that just the way things actually are? Anyway, any questions about iron or any of the trace elements? All right. So let me actually, yeah, okay. Here's the picture I was telling you about. Here's everything we've talked about. We've talked about the big four. And again, you need to know the big four, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, um, oxygen. What you don't need to know is the percentages. So you don't need to know oxygen is 65 or hydrogen is 9.5 or nitrogen is 3.3, none of that. You don't even need to know it's uh, majority oxygen, um, then carbon, then hydrogen, then nitrogen. You don't need to know that. Just know the big four. And then again, for your own knowledge, there's the smaller seven. Um, and again, you don't need to know that for the exam. But there's a lot on there that you could look up for independent work because we didn't discuss them. Same thing here with the trace elements. We only talked about fluorine and iodine. But look, there's a bunch of them. Right? So you could look that up. Um, things that might surprise you. So if someone says, oh, my God, there's copper in your food. And you're like, well, good, because I need some copper a little bit. Same with chromium, right? All these things might sound scary if you don't know these things, right? You need <laughs> copper. You need cobalt, chromium um silicone right the same thing that's used in electronics and maybe that's how somebody trying to scare you would say it. the same stuff that they use to make electronics they're put you can find it in their food well I, yep because you need it right you need it in small amounts so just some things to think about any questions about all that all right um let's see the next word for um, attendance is going to be tasty like this coffee is tasty moving forward let's check the time here sorry for the, all the noise in the background it is also a snow day luckily for us since we're stuck here but anyway my kids are kids are running wild so now that we know about some elements let's talk about let's take it up a step right we know about elements and we're actually going to even go back and talk more about elements but let's also take it up one more step and talk about something called a compound and this is a word that I'm almost definitely not going to test you on, but a word I'm going to use a lot, so you need to know what it is. When elements combine, right? So again, like I said, oxygen that we breathe, that's two, technically that's two oxygen molecules, that are, excuse me, two oxygen atoms that have come together. So when they come together, that is something called a compound. It's pretty simple, right? When you bring things together, when you bring elements together, it's called a compound. Technically, Obviously, they contain two or more elements, right? Because if it's just one, it's just the element. It's just an atom. But if you have two or more, it's called a compound. Also, it's a fixed ratio. And that makes sense. Hopefully, that makes sense to you because you will use this one as an example. Water molecule. Water is always H2O. Yes, there are some other molecules that are not H2O, and they're very close to H2O. But if they are not H2O, technically they are not water. So again, fixed ratio, two or more um, elements combining. And again, your book gives some examples. Um, table salt, we talked about this at the beginning of the chapter on Wednesday. Again, sodium is an explosive metal. Um, chlorine is a toxic gas used as a chemical weapon. And again, you could be, everybody knows about table salt, but if you didn't, you could say that stuff to scare somebody, right? Oh my God, you know what they put on the French fries at McDonald's? First of all, they've got metal on there, an explosive metal, and then they've got stuff used as a chemical weapon, right? You could say those things and not lie about what they're putting on French fries, right? So again, people will try to scare you, especially when it comes to chemicals. Uh, there's the loud noises I was telling you about. It's hard to be glad you're not here and that we're doing this online. Anyway, so yeah, so those are some examples. You don't need to know any examples for the exam. There might be some questions about examples on the um, study guide, but you don't need to know them for the exam. So any questions about what a compound is? All right, you guys are nice and easy. The next thing we're going to talk about, well, we've already talked about them. We've talked about atoms. 
But now we're going to really talk about them. Let's dig into what an atom is. So we already know what an element is, right? And each element consists of one kind of atom. What is an atom? It is the smallest unit of matter that still retains the properties of an element. So in this example, and I'll explain how you can know this later, what we're looking at is helium. It's got two protons in there. And again, I'm going to explain all that later. But um, that is the smallest unit, right? So we could have two helium atoms. Sure. Um, you could have a million helium atoms. But if you only have this one and you could break it down, break it down, and remove them from each other until finally you're left with this one helium atom. Now, you can't break this down anymore. If you break it down anymore, then you don't have – it's such a tough thing to say. I don't want to necessarily say this because there's some exceptions. But if you were to break this down the right way, it would no longer be helium as the example. So, again, it still retains the property of this element. That's an atom. It's the basic unit of um, of elements, right? That's it. So do you have any questions? And we're going to talk a little bit more about atoms, but so far, do you have any questions about what an atom is? All right. Let's talk about the structure of atoms. This should be a review. You've probably been learning about this for years and years and years, unless you're a non-traditional student like I was, in which case you learned it for years and years and years, and then there was a gap between real life and going to college. So now maybe it's a review, but either way, you probably heard of all this. So again, an atom, right? It can't be broken down anymore. That's the one thing. That's the basic unit of an element. And it itself is made up of three parts. And you need to know these three parts. You need to know there's a proton an electron and a neutron. You have to know that it's very important. You're going to be tested on it. You're going to need to use this information to figure out other problems. Specifically, if you're figuring out other problems, what you need to know is not just the name, but their charge. Protons are positively charged. And the easy way to remember that is the P, right? Proton positive. It's right there. Neutrons, it's going to be hard to remember now. Pay attention. Write notes if you need to. Neut <laughs> Here we go. Neutrons are neutral. Hey, there we go. Nice and easy, right? So by process of elimination, if you remember protons are positive and neutrons are neutral, then the only one left must be negative, right? And that's the electron. Is electron. there a sign for like neutral or no? Is there what? I'm sorry. Is there a sign for neutral? You know, like protons oh. are plus or? Great question. No, good point. Okay. So positive is plus. <laughs> a better looking plus than that. Electron is negative. And uh, neutrons is just no sign at all. Great question. Um, but yeah, so again, by process of elimination, if you can remember protons positive, neutrons neutral, then you can remember electron is negative. Another way to remember this is, um, think about this. It's a negative thing to get electrocuted, right? You don't want to get electrocuted. So there you go. Now you have a way of remembering all three. Now, all right, first of all, are there any questions about the subatomic particles? Okay, good. Um, independent work idea, if you want to look into this, technically, these protons, electrons, and neutrons, well, especially the protons and neutrons, they themselves are made up of other smaller things that we don't even talk about in this class. You might not have even learned about it in your actual chemistry class because it's more of a physics discussion, but you can look it up if you want. Anyway, if there's no questions about the subatomic particles, and again, know this for the exam. Um, let's talk about this next bullet point, which is that if – the number of protons, which are positive, if the number of protons equals the number of electrons, which is negative, then that means that the net electrical charge is zero. In other words, it's neutral. Hopefully that's really basic for you, right? If you have enough, the same amount of pluses as you do negatives, then it's zero. If you have $100 in your bank account, which is a plus, but you also have $100 in debt, which is a negative, then technically you're worth zero. I don't feel bad because most people probably, especially when you consider uh, student loans and mortgages, most people are probably worth negative. But anyway, that's a discussion for a different course altogether. So any questions about the subatomic particles or this idea of a neutral atom? Let me skip ahead really quick because I don't remember what the next slide is. Yeah, okay. Let me, all right, let me build on this too before we move forward, even though I'm going to talk about this later. So we know that if the number of protons and electrons are equal, then it's neutral. 
here's where people get confused and hopefully you'll get some some experience with this in lab if the number of protons is greater than the number of electrons then what charge do you think it would have so you have more protons than you have electrons what would the charge be you have more positive things than you have negative things or in the money example i was using you have more you have more money in your bank account than you than you owe money so what is it don't be afraid to have a wrong answer ah, that's all right we don't have time if you have more protons if you have more positive things than negative things then the charge is plus it's a positive charge meanwhile if you have more negative things if you have more electrons than protons then you have a negative charge i was hoping that hopefully that was just so easy you guys were like afraid to answer like surely he's not asking that easy of a question but yes if you have more positive things then it's a plus if you have more negative things then it's a minus if they equal out then it's neutral right it's a, it's a zero if you will so any questions about that Okay, I'll point down here at the bottom. We can see that hydrogen is an example. There's a neutral hydrogen. It has one proton, one electron. Just an example. Nothing to know on the exam. Then we here we have gold, 79 protons, 70, 79 electrons. That thing is neutral. Nothing to know. Just, just, uh, just an example that you don't need to know for the exam. Any questions about this slide? Okay. Um, the next word for attendance... Again, this one's going to be unique, so it'll be different for, for everybody, presumably. Instead of a word, it's a date. So give me your birth date. So the next thing for attendance will be your birth date. All right. Now, let's talk about the nucleus. Again, we're talking about the structure of an atom. So we talked about protons. We talked about neutrons. We talked about electrons. Those are the things that make up an atom. Now we're kind of like looking at, okay, those are the things. Where are they put together? Right? Because if you were to say a house is made up of you know, uh, four by fours and cinder blocks and I don't know, wires, whatever, nails, There's a lot of stuff, right? But you would say, okay, then we know what it's made of, but then you would say, okay, well, what are the parts of a house? We've got the basement, you've got the, the house itself, you have the roof. Same thing here, right? We talked about the parts of an atom. Now let's talk about, you know, where the you know, their parts as far as what makes them up or where they are. And the first thing we're talking about is the nucleus. That is the central core. What do you find in the nucleus? This is the most important as far as the exam is concerned. In the nucleus, you will find protons and neutrons. Or, as the question might say on the exam, where do you find the protons and neutrons? In the nucleus, right? So two different ways. It's asking the same thing. You could ask it in different ways. So in the nucleus, you find the protons and neutrons. So the electrons, you might ask, well, where are they? Well, they move around the nucleus, floating around the outside. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But yes. This is all important stuff that you need to know for the exam. Know where you can find the protons and neutrons and know where you can find the electrons. Any questions about that? All right. This is just an example, the uranium. Again, I'm going to put an X to it to remind you that you don't need to know that example. But here's something your book doesn't talk about. I'm going to talk about it very quickly just for your own knowledge because the concept of what I'm about to tell you is going to be useful a little bit later. But... So again, can someone please tell me what charge proton has? This thing right here, what charge does it have? Positive. Still, okay, good. I was about to check to make sure I'm still online. Yes, it's positive. Now, uranium, its number is 92, meaning it has 92 protons squished together right there in the nucleus. Now, let me ask you this. Has anybody ever tried to put like a plus and a plus together with magnets, right? Or north and north, whatever. Have you ever tried to put the same together? And what happens when you try to do that? Don't they like, like, kind of like, like, they like reject each other? Yeah. If it's opposite, they come together, right? But if it's the same, yeah. like I'm saying here, like if you have, let's say you have a magnet here. This is so horrible. <laughs> There's the plus side, there's a minus side, and then, uh, let me do it like this, another magnet here, <laughs> so bad, another, again, plus side, minus side, so these things are repelling each other, right, and a plus and a plus don't want to be together, 
And it's the same thing with protons and electrons. Protons don't want to be next to other protons because they're repelling each other. Electrons don't want to be near electrons either because they're repelling each other. But think about this. There's 92 of these protons squished together, and they are trying to get apart. And now, again, imagine trying to hold like 92 magnets that don't want to be together and holding them together. That would take a lot of energy, right? And that, just for your own knowledge, again, this specific knowledge is not important for this um, semester, but the concept will be important a little bit later. But anyway, so all that energy, it takes a lot of energy to keep those things together. And if you were to break that energy or release that energy, you, there'd be a lot of it, right? So hence nuclear bombs and hence nuclear energy to produce electricity. That's how it works, right? If you can separate those things, whatever's holding, whatever energy it takes to keep those things together, if you can break that, that energy is released. And that's the concept that'll be important later. Whatever energy it takes to hold something together, when we're talking, especially when we're talking about atoms and molecules, whatever energy it takes to hold them together, that energy will be released when you break that, right? And break those things holding it together. Important concept later. Uh, never specifically the uranium part, but we'll, we'll come back to that. So anyway, any questions about where you find protons, electrons, and neutrons? All right. Here's just another picture from your book. Here we're looking at helium instead of um, uranium. There we go. We've got our two protons right there. We've got our two neutrons right here. We have an electron floating around over here, an electron floating around right here. And there's different ways to draw atoms, and you're going to become familiar with them in the um, in the lab. This is a more realistic one because you can see it kind of shows the electrons like there's a cloud, and that's more realistic because technically – the electrons are not following this perfect little orbit like planets around the sun. Technically, that's more like it's in a cloud and they could be in any of these places. But as far as we're concerned, to figure out how atoms work, it's going to be this orbit that we're worried about. We'll come back to that later. But I just wanted to point that out, though. When you see a picture like I just drew, that's the same picture as – or it's the same thing. It's just showing it different than – you know, uh, the picture that your book showed was just the clouds. And again, we'll talk about that later. All right, here we get in some nitty gritty stuff that you need to know for the exam. Atoms of an element have the same unique number of protons. Very, very, very important bullet point right there. Another way of saying this is the number of protons defines the element. So you can see right here for an example, and that's, excuse me, that's also the atomic number, right? So the number of protons, that's the atomic number. And it also defines the element. And here we have helium as an example down here. Its atomic number is two. And you don't need to memorize that. But if I gave you that information, if I said in an exam, I said helium's atomic number is two, how many protons does it have? The answer is two. That you do need to know. I would give you the information, but you would need to memorize, you do need to know that the atomic number is the number of protons. Now, if you were to take away a proton, right, and you, if you only had one proton, that changes the element because, again, like I said earlier, the element is defined by its number of protons. So if you take one away and you only have one proton, then you have hydrogen. And, again, it's just an example. You don't need to memorize that hydrogen has one uh, proton. The point is, once you change that new, uh, proton number, you no longer have the same element. Um or, for example, if you were to add a proton, um, you would no longer have helium. If it has three protons, you would have lithium. Again, you don't need to memorize that. I'm, the point here is that if you change the proton number, then you change the element. Make sure you know that. And then later, we're going to happen, you're going to need to know, well, what if you change the number of electrons? What do you call that? And what do you call it when you change the number of neutrons? We'll talk about all that. But for now, just let that sink in. You cannot change the number of protons, or you can. But if you do, it is no longer the same element. And again, like I've already said on this bullet point, we've already talked about this example, helium. Helium has two protons, therefore its atomic number is two. No other element has just two protons, right? Because if it did, anything that has only two protons would be uh, helium. And I put just two protons because as I read that, I, could, I can think of some wise ass being, pardon my French, but some wise guy saying, well, technically, carbon has a total of six protons, so it has two protons. But yeah, yeah, it does have two protons, right, in, in addition to four others. So yes, if it only has two protons, it's helium. But 
Anyway, that's the atomic number. You need to know the atomic number. You need to know that if you change the number of protons, that you change the element. Any questions about that? All right, here's another important one. A little bit less important, but as far as grading is concerned and exams are concerned, this is important because this is information you're going to need to do some problem solving. And that is the mass number. The mass number is the sum of protons plus neutrons. Another way of saying that, less mathematically, is that the protons plus the neutrons equals the mass number. I guess that's not math less mathematically, at least not when I write it. But here we have an example. Helium's atomic number is two, right? Meaning it has two protons. Its mass number is four. All right. What is not shown on here is its number of neutrons. So here we go. Let's figure this out. We know it has two protons. We know its mass number is four. So how many neutrons does it have? Can anybody tell me? Is it six? Oh, nope. But I could see where you might get that wrong if you were if you're listening to me. But if you and if you can't see my squiggly writing, if you look closely at the writing, two plus so two protons plus how many neutrons equals oh, two? There you go. Yeah, two. Yes. And you will have question at least one question like that on the exam. Well, I'll give you the information. Like, here's the mass number. You'll either know the mass number or the atomic number, or the number of neutrons, right? I'm going to give you, you're going to have one, two of those three parts of the equation, and then I'm going to ask you to give me the other one. So that's how that's going to work. Any questions about that? Okay, and heads up too, there's one question on the study guide that's almost like a trick question. So if I was using this, it's not helium that they use, it's a different one, but if it was helium, it would say something like, um, helium's, ma uh, helium's mass number is four, um, its atomic number is two. How many protons does it have? And, and because then because the question is giving you all these numbers, you might your brain might automatically jump to, okay, I need to do a math problem. But it's a trick question because as I said, helium's mass number is two. Helium's atomic number is two. How many protons are there? So really, it's just asking you how many protons there are, and that is the atomic number. So there is a trick question like that on the exam. I mean, on the study guide, and it might also be on the exam. It won't be helium. But anyway, any questions about that? All right. So there's a difference between the mass number, which is what we talked about. That's the protons plus the neutrons. That's the mass number. And here's where things get more confusing. That is different than the atomic mass. Now, the atomic mass is close to the mass number. But it might be different because the atomic mass represents the average of all naturally occurring forms. For example, if you were to take a normal human being, just pick one out of the, out of the, out of the earth, one normal human being, how many fingers do they have? And this isn't a trick question, but it's a thumb, not a finger. How many finger is the normal, one particular normal human? I'm the normal human being. How about that? How many fingers do I have? Can someone tell me? Ten. Good. Right. So that would almost be like the that would almost be like my mass number. Just a normal, normal old human being has 10 fingers. However, what do you think the average numbers are for humans? Like if you were to take all the humans and count their fingers and then average it, what do you think the average is for fingers? How many, what is the average number of fingers that a humans has a human has? Any guesses? Ten. Um, I would guess not. I don't know. I don't actually know the answer. But think about this. Some people have more than 10 fingers. Some people have less than 10 fingers. Does that make sense? For example, if you, whoever's talking to me right now, I assume you have 10 fingers. Let's say it's you with your 10 fingers and me with my 10 fingers and my buddy who lost a couple of fingers in the war who's got eight fingers, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see. And to average that, what's that? 28, calculate... Come on, 20, 20, ah, 28 divided by three. Amongst us, the three of us, the average finger number is 9.3. Does that make sense? Just hard. Does, anybody, does that make sense to you guys? So if we were to take the average fingers, yeah, between the three of us, it would be 9.3. And I know, obviously, 
the number of fingers we have is not an important concept. What is an important concept is that is what the mass number is. So your normal, and here we go, we'll talk about hydrogen as an example. Your normal old helium has one proton and one, or excuse me, no neutrons. So your normal helium, it's a it's mass number to back it up to what we talked about earlier. And remember, it's mass number is your protons plus neutrons. Its mass number is one. That's your average everyday helium. However, some heliums actually have a neutron, right? So their mass number would be two. And even fewer, very rarely, some heliums have two neutrons. Therefore, their mass number would be three. Therefore, again, your normal old helium, its atomic number, or excuse me, its mass number would be one, most of them, most of them that you find in nature. But if you're averaging them all up, then what you would get, uh, I think, I don't remember exactly, but the atomic mass number, I think, for, for um, helium is one point, like, zero zero eight or maybe 1.08 point is it's very close to one meaning most of the hydrogens in in nature are going to have that one proton but there are some that have a few more hence the slightly average number just like if the average human has i forget about that if the average human has 10.0001 fingers that would tell you okay really a large a large number of people have the normal 10 fingers but if the average was like 10.5 that would tell you actually yes your average most people do have 10 fingers but there's quite a few people who have extra does that make sense if you compare those two numbers or does that not make sense that's a better question does anybody need me to explain that that's a good place to end it the last word for attendance, sorry, I've got this written down. That's why I'm looking at my phone. Is going to be what's a two words actually? Pleasant secretary. So like the kind of person you know, or like the secretary of defense, for example. But a pleasant secretary of defense. So, are there any questions about anything? All right, make sure that you send me your emails right away. Normally, normally the time is Wait, pleasant. What? I'm sorry. The last. The last words, pleasant secretary. All right, so again, everybody, make sure you send me the emails right away. I can see who's online, so don't send the, the keywords to your friends and tell them to, uh, you know, tell them to send the keywords because then they're cheating. They'll just get in trouble. Don't help them get in trouble. Any questions? All right, you guys have a great weekend. Don't forget um, – Pre, your lab from this week is due on today, tonight, and your pre-lab along with your first thing of independent work is due Sunday night. And I'm here to help you. I'll be online for office hours.